One of the things that you might know, you might not know, is that as a denomination, that being the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, we are celebrating Immigration Day today. Now, I don't know if our denomination did it on purpose. I do not know if they just did it to piggyback on Independence Day or if they did it really on purpose with a message to give to the congregations. Now, being who I am and believing not in coincidence but God incidents, I choose to believe that the denomination put it together with a message in mind. Indeed, there is a reference to the words of John Adams about Independence Day to a letter that he wrote to his wife, Abigail. It says, pump and parade with shows, games, and sports, guns, bells, and bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. That is how John Adams described and told his wife that his friends and the nation were going to celebrate Independence Day. And we have been doing that for over 240 years. But he also said this, Independence Day is to be a day to commemorate a day of deliverance. But how am I supposed to preach about deliverance? When the only thing that you and I know is freedom. How can I teach about citizenship? With less than 72 hours of being a citizen. How can I preach about immigration if I am no longer an immigrant? It's quite easy, actually. I can talk about deliverance because not everyone is free. Look around the world. Not everyone is free. I can teach about citizenship because I know how it feels not being one. And I can preach about immigration because no matter what I do, I will always be an immigrant. Did you know actually that the government could take possibly my citizenship? That once you become a citizen, it can be taken away from you? Not if you were born citizen. That is a God's right. But if by the power of law, you became a citizen by the same power that citizenship can be taken away. Now, it's not easy to be taken away, I will grant you that. It is only happens for about three reasons. First, high treason. Second, if you have fake papers that make you become a citizen, if you use some way of tricking the government to giving you citizenship. The last one is that if you do not only treason, but you do not follow the country in times of war. Now, that is tough to digest sometimes, yet it never happens. In a vast search on Google, I couldn't find not one case where citizenship was taken from someone. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. That just means that we don't know it. I think it's beautiful, astute, and very intelligent to put Immigration Day before Independence Day. Because it helps us to remember as a church that we 
all were immigrant first. You have heard that thing that says that only when you know what is salty, you know what is sweet. Only when you were dirty, you know what it's like to be clean. <coughs> only when you were lost, you know what it's like to be found. But how can we do that? How can we do that when none of us in this room have ever not been free? Now, you can say, wait a minute, Mario. Not everyone is free in this room. We have our prison cells in our mind. Sometimes that which holds us captives are not a person, but sometimes are our own dreams. Sometimes what kept us captives are our sickness, our dreams of power, wealth, and money, then I would say we're definitely not free. It is feeding, it is right and good to celebrate Immigration Day before independence because it allows a framework of reference as to how it is that we can explore our independence. This is what the Gospel of Luke chapter 15 says. It is good to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. That is the end of the story of the son that loses all the money and comes back to his father. And I think that is what happens if we remember that we were immigrants at one point and now we are citizens. But you know what? I don't want to preach about this concept anymore of immigration for no other reason that it's such a hot topic in our communities, in our society. I really at this point should not be preaching about immigration from a political stance. It really doesn't matter whether you are on the left or on the right or on the back or on the front of immigration, pro or against. I really have no power to preach about what you should do but I can do reference of what God says about welcoming. About what happens when we welcome people in our midst. So now I read the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 to verse 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sends me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of the Lord. If you're careful reading that text, you will see the first thing that says is that God, Jesus, is in you and is in me and is in every heart in this room. It doesn't matter whether you are a committed Christian that goes to church all the time or if you are the one member of the family that goes to church on Easter and Christmas and to poke you guys up a little bit when somebody in the family gets baptized. There is no difference on the power of God in me and in you. God is, Jesus is, the Holy Spirit is 
in every heart. So when you do not welcome someone in your home, when you do not welcome someone in your church, when you do not welcome someone in your small circle, you are not just not welcoming that person, but you are not welcoming Christ. And that includes when people are evil. Even when a person is evil, God has the power to abide in that person's heart. The second thing about that text, and this starts in around verse 41, it talks about prophets. It talks about the power of welcoming and being and accepting the word of a prophet. When you accept a prophet in your home, it's as if you were a prophet. Let me explain that a little bit different. When I go visit you, you are not only accepting a minister, you're also accepting a prophet. You know what is a prophet? A prophet is not a person that can tell the future. A real prophet is a person that speaks about God's love. If you accept a, some, a, a person that talks about God's love without judgment, that means that you will receive the reward of the prophet. If you continue reading the text, you will see they talk about righteousness. The word righteousness means justice, God's justice. When you act in justice with those who come through your doors and you welcome them into your home, you are acting in God's righteousness, with God's judgment. You are being just. And then it finished with the most beautiful part of the text for me. The text talks about the little ones. Not children only, but all those who represent God. And they talked about a cup of cold water. It is easy for us to understand a cup of cold water. We have freezers and we have ice. But when the text was written, it didn't have what we have. You have to pay attention that what the text is asking is not a little thing. It's not just giving them a cup of cold water. It's giving them a cup of cold water. You know what they had to do to get cold water back then? They have to go to the dwell. They have to go to, go to the bottom of where the spring were. They have to walk miles. It was an effort to give someone a cup of cold water. And God is saying, if you do that, the reward will never be taken away from you. And so it's a little bit like this. If somebody comes and knocks on your door and they are thirsty and you give them water, that is good. You have done well. But when you go out of your way and you sit them down and you offer them a meal and a pair of jeans and a jacket and you offer them food and a place to stay and friends to meet and places to go and recommendations and you go the extra mile that simple cup becomes cold because it's refreshing. And so it is why we baptize children. We often do not do it for the sake of the children alone, but for the sake of the parents. 
We do it for the sake of the church. And we do it above all for the sake of the ministers, of the prophets. I am going to drink this water by the end of this sermon. And I'm not going to drink it because it's holy water. But I'm going to drink it because we already pray for it and we already use it in a baptism. And this water, I believe right now, has the power of God. Because you saw it and I saw it. And right now, this water right here has become cold to refresh and to nurture and to love. And so I drink this water not only for my sake, but for your sake, for you to remember that when we offer water, it must be cold. Another way to see the water functioning within our mess is for us to see this cup of cold water. Some of you will call it the elements of bread and wine. Some of you will call it a table of the Lord. Some of you will say sacrament of communion. But today, I would like to call it a cup of cold water that will refresh your soul and your spirit. Because you have come from east and west and north and south and you have come and found this a feast, a celebration that gives the glory to God forever and ever. Church, let us pray.